As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today you and I are going to return to the ancient ruins of Thyatira, and this program is called Taking a Stand for Christ in Difficult Situations. And I want you to order the series, which is called Thyatira and Sardis, and please also order my books, A Light in Darkness and No Room for a Compromise. You can order all these wonderful resources by going online or by giving us a call right now. But buckle your seatbelts, because now you and me, we're going to return to the ancient ruins of Thyatira. Welcome to the ancient city of Thyatira. It doesn't look like much today because it's just fallen into ruins and rubble. And most of this site today lies under the construction of the modern Turkish city of Akhisar. It's quite a large city. But if we were able to remove all these modern buildings and excavate, we would find that the city of Thyatira was quite significant. It wasn't very spectacular, but it was very large. Nearby was the amazing city of Pergamum, which sat on the peak of an Acropolis. That is where the proconsul or the governor of the region lived. The city of Pergamum was established by one of the soldiers of Alexander the Great. His name was Lysimachus. He trusted one of his commanders, his name was Philetaris, and gave Philetaris charge of the region of Pergamum and even building the city of Pergamum. And then when it was being built, they had a disagreement between the two of them, and Philetaris rebelled against Lachimachus and proclaimed himself the king of Pergamum. And that is what eventually started the kingdom of Pergamum, which became so illustrious in those times. And the city of Pergamum was unlike any other city. It gleamed with gold. In fact, as travelers would approach the city, they could see the gold glistening on the Acropolis of the city. There was the great throne of Zeus. There was the great theater of Pergamum, which was so famous. The steepest theater in the Roman world is seated 10,000 seats. The city was just amazing. And at the base of Pergamum was the Asclepius, Asclepian, where people would come from around the world to be healed by the god Asclepius, and the city was rich. It was filled with eminent individuals, famous writers, historians. The city of Pergamum just attracted wealth and privilege, and because it was so rich, enemies in the east wanted to attack it, sack it, and take its treasures. And not only that, they knew that if they could control Pergamum, then they could control the entire region. So the people of Pergamum said, we have to do something about this. We need to form a barricade to stop Eastern aggressors from getting to us. And so they began to look for a site to build a barricade, and they found a very ancient site where the Hittite kingdom had once been established. And on that site, they established a military outpost, which was called Thyatira. That's what this is. The purpose of Thyatira was to stop those enemies from the east long enough that the troops in Pergamum could be assembled to get ready to fight for their defense. And that is the reason why Pergamum was not really spectacular when it comes to architecture. However, it was filled with masses of Roman soldiers because they were stationed here to stop those aggressors from the east. And because it was a city that was filled with Roman troops, it serviced the needs of the Roman army. So it was filled with workers and craftsmen who were members of specialized trade guilds who prepared supplies for the military. 
because of the need to have so many various industries to service the needs of the Roman military that was established here, the city of Thyatira had a lot of trade guilds. By the time of the first century, trade guilds were popular all over the Roman Empire, but scholars estimate no city in the province of Asia had more trade guilds than the city of Thyatira. But back in the first century, they were not called trade guilds, they were called collegia. We're gonna call them trade guilds, but the technical term was collegia. And there were two different kinds of trade guilds or two different kinds of collegia. There was collegia licita, and there was collegia illicita. A collegia illicita was a trade guild that was approved by the government. And because it was approved by the government, it had the right to function, it had the right to earn income, it had the right to have membership. But then there was also collegia illicita. Illicita means it was illegal or it was illicit. And if you were called collegia illicita, then you were banned from being able to operate. Now here's what's really interesting. Every trade guild meeting began with the worship of a god, and it had a communal mill, and it also had a membership. Well, in a very certain way, this is similar to the New Testament church. The New Testament church worshiped, they had a communal meal, which was communion, and there were members of the church. Well, in the mind of the early Roman government, the early church meetings were like a collegia or a trade guild of a religious nature, and there were religious trade guilds at that time. But because they did not have the approval of the government, the Christian church was called collegia illicita. It did not have the right to function and therefore every time churches gathered together to worship and have communion and to be together, they were violating the law. And this is one reason why the early church was persecuted. But because of Thyatira's huge military infrastructure, the city was brimming with expert craftsmen and workers that were considered to be an indispensable part of the support system for the army. They were members of guilds that became such an integral part of society that if a person wasn't a member of a trade guild, it would have been difficult for him to find work in his profession. And functioning outside of a guild, which operated on a buddy system that preferred members above outsiders, well, that was almost impossible. And this kept business circulating between members of the group and enabled them to protect the market from outsiders who might try to penetrate the market with new goods or services. Those who tried to work outside of a trade guild found little opportunity to earn an income. Trade guilds formed business relationships, traded with other guilds, kept business circulating within their preferred groups, and essentially, they eliminated non-guild members from doing any significant business in a respective city. This enabled guilds to corner or dominate and control the market. It's amazing that this is all that is left of the outpost called Thyatira. And today, really, you can't see much of it because the rest of it is covered by modern buildings which are built all around us. In fact, if you hear cars, that's because this is a central square in the very middle of the city and cars are driving all around us. But at one time, this place was literally teeming with Roman soldiers and trade guilds. Trade guilds were essential because there were so many various kinds of artisans and craftsmen and professionals who lived in this city to provide various services for the sustenance of the Roman military that was stationed here. In guild meetings, guild members celebrated pagan feasts, and that included eating, drinking, and reveling as part of the guild's regular activities. Worship of pagan deities was a central function in these closed societies. And as part of their festivities, members worshiped each god's particular favorite god within the private confines of their meetings. And the meetings abounded with alcohol, promiscuity, and even orgies. It's impossible to exaggerate the importance that worship of pagan gods played in trade guilds all over the Roman world. You see, pagans believed that staying in good favor with the gods was essential for their businesses to prosper. So they worshiped gods as a central part of trade guild meetings. 
They even made sacrifices to the god's patron god. And when a person was initiated into a trade guild, a part of the initiation process included offering a sacrifice to the patron god that the particular guild worshipped. If a member of the trade guild refused to participate in the guild's activities, then he was kicked out of the guild and was blacklisted so that he could not get a job anywhere in the city. Just imagine if you were blacklisted because you did not want to partake in an orgy. Your Christian faith will not allow you to do that. And yet if you don't partake in it, you're going to be put on a blacklist which will keep you from getting a job anywhere else in town. That is what was happening to believers who were leaving the trade guilds because they could no longer do what they did before they came to Christ. Christ called them out of darkness into light, and those trade guilds were places where darkness abounded. So they revoked their membership or they quit participating, and as a result, they began to lose their job jobs, and this plunged many early believers into poverty. It's important for you to understand that roughly 10% of the Roman Empire was slaves. Many slaves were just common workers who performed menial tasks, but there were other slaves that were highly cultivated and sophisticated, and they carried out professional services for their owners. But regardless of their social status, slaves had few rights in society. So special slave-oriented trade guilds emerged that became important for slaves. And there were enormous guilds for the slave community, including guilds for mechanics, idol makers, wool workers, oil producers, wine producers, blacksmiths, carpenters, linen workers, makers of garments, makers of dye, leather workers, tanners, pottery makers, bakers, textile workers, masons, slave dealers and weapon makers, ferrymen, secretaries, and even physicians who were usually trained slaves during the Roman period. And there were other guilds as well for handicrafts and other professions that are just too numerous to mention. And because slaves had few places where they could freely gather for social interaction, membership in a trade guild gave them a sense of social belonging and a safe place where they could gather in a world that did not give them much recognition. And as was customary in all trade guilds, slave-oriented trade guilds also started with pagan sacrifices to their particular group's pagan god, and they were infamous for reveling, drunkenness, and sexual promiscuity. And when a guild member died, his fellow members were responsible to see he was properly buried. Having membership in a slave guild was very important in the time of the first century because when slaves died, they didn't know where they would be buried or who would care for their remains. But because they were members of a slave guild, they knew that their burial would be taken care of respectfully. And it's very interesting that most of the early church in the first century were from the slave community. Most of them were manual workers, so they were members of trade guilds. And many of the customs of burying the dead carried from the trade guilds into the early Christian church. Again, most of the early Christian church were manual workers, so they had had some kind of experience in a trade guild even if they had been revoked or if they had been blacklisted. At some point, they had been members of a trade guild, and many of the guild's activities were carried over to become traditions in the early church. But there were also trade guilds for people of a higher rank in society. And as was true in all trade guilds, when the richer guild meetings began, the members celebrated a pagan feast, they socially interacted and ate together, they drank together and imbibed in orgies around the group's patron god. Upper classes frequently found it fashionable to worship gods of a taboo nature, which involved deviant sexual behavior and riotous acts that were not fitting for a public temple setting. So when higher classes privately met in their guilds to worship a god that required this kind of behavior, they often did it in the confidentiality of their private guild meetings where morally perverse activities occurred behind closed doors. Upper classes could afford to purchase their own 
own permanent renting hall for their groups. And such halls were elaborately decorated to express the group's wealth, and guilds attempted to use their business connections and influence to exert influence in society. And guilds also provided a place where friends and associates could celebrate with friends. Membership in a trade guild was so crucial that few could move upward in society without membership in a guild. And this issue of membership in trade guilds became a very serious problem for believers throughout the entire Roman Empire because to retain membership in these groups put them in jeopardy of compromising their relationship with Christ. In Acts 16, 14, and 15, Luke writes about a woman from Thyatira named Lydia who was a seller of purple. Thyatira was located in the ancient Lydian kingdom, and it's likely Lydia was named for that kingdom that once dominated this part of Western Asia Minor. But Lydia was an affluent woman of Greek descent engaged in the prosperous business of selling purple. And in Acts 16, 14, we read that Lydia worshiped God. But the Greek suggests Lydia was a proselyte Jew, which means she converted from paganism to the Jewish faith, and then later she converted to Christ. And this may be the reason she gathered with others to worship on the Sabbath near a river just outside the ancient city of Philippi. Acts chapter 16 tells us while Lydia was at that river near the city of Philippi, she heard the preaching of the Apostle Paul and she gave her heart to Christ. And according to Acts chapter 16, not just Lydia, but her whole household. And the word household, which is used in Greek, implies that she had quite a large household there in Philippi, which by the way, was a very expensive city. And to have a big house in Philippi, you had to have a lot of money, but anyone that was a seller of purple was rich, and Lydia was a seller of purple. The word purple refers to a purple colored dye that was specially used for coloring the garments of politicians or high ranking military commanders and military officers. Thyatira was the home for large military forces with many high ranking military commanders and military officers, so it had a big need for this color purple. Lydia provided this dye for the highest military commanders and military officers stationed in Thyatira. This color of dye denoted power and prestige, and it was especially used in robes and garments of high-ranking officials, and that is why it was in great demand in Thyatira where there were many high-ranking officials and officers. The color purple was extracted from the Murex shell, a small seashell found in the Mediterranean Sea. And when the gland of the shell was poked by a sharp instrument, it secreted a substance that was rich blue or deep purple. And after swimmers retrieved the shell from the sea, they piled them in heaping quantities so specialists could milk the shells one at a time. And once the color was collected, professionals marketed it to the garment industry for the dyeing of luxurious robes and garments. The labor-intensive and time-consuming process to extract this dye resulted in purple being one of the most expensive products in the Roman world. Purple was even used to color the garments of the high priest in Jerusalem, and large quantities of discarded murex shells have been found there. Those who sold purple could demand exorbitant prices, and consequentially, they were very prosperous, and that is what we find in the story of Lydia. Cities with a lot of troops needed a lot of purple. It is likely that Lydia provided purple for all the troops which were stationed here. But to get all of that dye here, first they had to dive into the sea and collect the shells. Then they had to milk the shells. They had to store the substance, transport it all the way to Thyatira. My friend, this was an extremely expensive process. And those who sold purple were very affluent and were very prosperous. But around Thyatira it was a local plant which grew in large numbers, which when it was crushed also produced a purple color that could be used as dye. 
This purple was also very difficult to produce and was very expensive. And as a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, it means Lydia was well connected. And as a prosperous seller of purple, it means at least at some point in Lydia's past, she had been a member of one of the trade guilds for those who were sellers of purple. When she converted to Judaism, she may have had to leave that trade guild. Certainly when she came to Christ, she could no longer participate in those very pagan guilds. But the very fact that Luke identifies her as a seller of purple means at some point along the way, Lydia was well connected in the business community and was likely at one point a member of a trade guild. But these trade guilds were creating real problems for Christians in Thyatira. Before they came to Christ, they could free attend the guild's meetings. They could worship a pagan god, get drunk, participate in orgies. But now they got saved. They had repented and had left that world of darkness and they were living in light. And they knew as followers of Christ, they could no longer go to those meetings. And they were losing their jobs because they refused to participate in the guilds. But here in Thyatira, there was a leading Christian woman who was saying to the church members, hey, what does it hurt to burn a little incense to the God so that you can keep your job? Why do we need to live so separate from everyone else? Let's just compromise a little. The pagans will understand us more. They'll be more tolerant of us if we won't live so separate. Her name was Jezebel. And Jesus addressed this problem in Revelation chapter two. In Revelation 2.18, Jesus said, Unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Revelation 2.19, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Then in Revelation 2.20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Revelation 2.21, and I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Verse 22, behold, I will cast her into a bed with them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. But notice in Revelation 2:20, Jesus said, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Notice that Jesus said that Jezebel was teaching his people to worship idols and to commit fornication. This is a reference to the trade guilds. She was literally saying, hey guys, quit being so narrow-minded. Let's be more open-minded. Let's go into the trade guilds. Let's burn a little incense to the gods, do what they're asking us to do. At least we'll keep our jobs. And Jesus was against this because she was offering a doctrine of compromise. And my friends, Jesus tells us there's no room for compromise. Jesus said to the members of the church at Thyatira, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And my friends, today Jesus is still speaking to us, telling us that we are not to accommodate compromise in our life. We're to take a stand for Jesus and be faithful all the way to the end. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And even though there have been many episodes of persecution against the church, and though you may be facing difficult times today, and we may all be facing difficult times in the future, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but we need to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to you and me right now. 
How did believers in the first century survive the intense persecution that was waged against them? What kind of persecution did they endure? And how does all of this relate to Christians today? In this series, take a tour with Rick, Thyatira, and Sardis. Rick Renner walks you through the ancient ruins of Thyatira and Sardis and opens history and the scripture to you in a way that makes it come alive. He discusses how the gospel first came to these cities, how early Christians paid a high price for their faith, what kind of opposition early Christians faced, this five-part documentary-style visual series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $11. We're also offering you the books A Light in Darkness and No Room for Compromise, Volumes 1 and 2 of the A Light in Darkness series. These beautiful hardbound books feature on-location photography with added artwork and illustrations to enhance the in-depth scriptural teaching that makes the early New Testament come alive. On every page, Rick reveals insights into the ancient world and the disturbing realities that that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a pagan world. These books are available right now for $80 each. Don't miss this special offer. Bundle the series, take a tour with Rick, Thyatira, and Sardis, and the books of light and darkness, and no room for compromise. And for a limited time, we are also offering Rick's book, Fallen Angels, Giants, Monsters, and the World Before the Flood, for a special pre-sale discounted price. Go to renner.org to order. Call the number on your screen, or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and guess what? I'm in Joel Renner's office in Moscow, and look what's here on the wall. Here we have two televisions which regularly show our two channels in Russia. First, we have GNC, and look, right now we're showing Carrie Pickett. It's one of the programs which is produced by Andrew Womack Ministries, and this program is completely produced in the Russian language, and it's being broadcast with all of our other broadcasters to 83 nations of the world, and we have it up. So we constantly see what's being broadcast on this channel. But then we have the other channel, which is called TBV, and this is the brand new national channel in Russia, which is being broadcast across all 11 time zones in Russia. There's a big difference between these two channels. This is a satellite network, which goes to 83 nations of the world, and TBV is the new instrument God has given us to reach into every home in the country of Russia. And that is amazing, look at it. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm so excited about what's coming into homes all over Russia through TBV and also through the GNC, the Good News Channel by satellite. And with these two channels, we are reaching Russian speakers all over the world, and I wanted to tell you about it. And if you're a partner that helps us to do this, thank you. And if you've not given to this project yet, you can join us as a part of our giving team to take teaching that people can trust to them wherever they live in the world, either by satellite or by the national channel, which is going into every home in Russia. Thank you so much, and please pray about becoming a part of our giving team. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life, amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Please like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends so more people can see it.